The views expressed on this broadcast of Step by Step Towards Emotional Sobriety with Dr. Alan Berger do not necessarily reflect those of Take 12 Radio, KHLT Recovery Broadcasting, or our affiliates. Take 12 Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting are not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. And now, here's your host, Dr. Alan Berger and the Monty Man. Well, greetings, friends and recovery family. How the heck are you? It is good to be back. I have been, I wish I could say I I had been vacationing in the beautiful Cape Cod area of the United States, Uh, but it was more work than anything else. But it was certainly a a real enjoyable time and got to rub shoulders with some of the movers and shakers of the recovery and treatment world. All right, Dr. Berger, what are we doing this week? Well, this week we're continuing to um, talk about master therapists and people that uh, whose ideas um, really help us understand this whole issue of emotional sobriety and to uh, unpack this problem that, you know, creates our need for emotional sobriety, which is our emotional dependency. And this week we're going to be talking about Dr. Karen Horney. Uh Her last name is spelled H-O-R-N-E-Y, and she is an amazing, or I should say was an amazing lady. She was originally trained as a psychoanalyst and uh, was one of the, I mean, brilliant, uh, you know, rising stars in the whole psychoanalytic field. And as she started to develop her own ideas and her own concepts, she started to differ with Freud uh, in some very, very key aspects. And one of them was, is that she thought that the interpersonal forces in a family meaning that there's the need to be loved and accepted, right, to belong, uh-huh. was much more powerful than the libido mechanism that Freud talked about. So she changed her understanding of, of human development to really center around this whole interplay of, of the parents and the children and what happens in the interaction. So she was one of the first people that focused on the interaction in the family as a key to understanding our human development. And as we're going to see tonight, that interaction creates a very, very powerful force in our lives. And so we're going to explore that, talk about some of her ideas, and see how they relate to this whole topic on emotional sobriety. All right. Um, I I, I want to read this poem real quick here. Um, I came across this. It was actually sent to me. And I have to tell you, at first I thought, okay, if 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 I'm, it's a prayer. Um, well, it, it sounds like a prayer. I should say, it. It, if somebody was saying this uh, to to God, I, I I can understand. But this was written to another individual, another human being, and this is what it said. And I, I'm I'm sure we're going to end up talking about this because this really shows how we think sometimes and and i think this is kind of a dangerous thought it's called know that you will and here 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 it is i am waiting waiting for you i know that you will come i know that you will meet me here i give you all of me my hopes my dreams my fears my weakness my strengths come into my life heal me deliver me change me complete me Perfect me. I know that you will. Wow. I read that, and I, it just made me sad, Dr. Berger. Yeah. Yeah, that's the fantasy we have, though, isn't it, Monty? See, I think that's the thing that our culture very, very much promotes. That's the kind of a fantasy, because we all think that somehow that relationship will complete us that that relationship will make us whole, Mm -hmm. that if the person loves us in the right way, that we're going to be okay. And that's the setup, right? That's the big setup that we all have, because that 
in itself is a great definition of emotional dependency, isn't it? Oh, boy, it's like ever. You're going to do all these things for me that I'm not able to do for myself. And it's a very, very powerful, powerful force in our lives. And, you know, that's a great segue to talk about Dr. Karen Horney's work. So let, let me kind of set the stage for this. And But first of all, let me put this in context. So she had an institute in New York and where she treated people. And I just discovered, and I think I mentioned uh, this maybe on one of our other shows, or maybe just to you in one of our talks before we went on the air, is that she was very influential um, to Bill Wilson. Hmm. And it's a little-known fact that Bill was a big fan of Dr. Karen Horney. In fact, what I heard is that many of the early members of AA who were in New York were actually in treatment with her. And if they weren't in treatment with her, they were in treatment with Adler. Because Alfred Adler was another person that the AA program contributes a lot of their understanding of psychology to. Mm. So let's talk about her ideas and see how they fold into this whole issue of emotional sobriety. So as I said before, she thought that the interaction that took place between parent and child was critical in understanding our human development. Now, she also put it in the context of culture. But what we're going to focus on is this desire that a child has, very, that comes in very early in life to be loved, to be accepted, and to belong. So what she says is that we all begin our life with a true self, right? Right. And that true self is just our potential. I mean, many of the writers back in the 50s that were talking about the true self likened it to an acorn and its relationship to an oak tree. An acorn is the seed that will eventually grow into the oak tree. But in order for that acorn to grow, it has to have certain conditions. But one of the ways I talk about this, and I quote her in my book on 12 Hidden Rewards, it's on page 5 if you're reading with me. Okay. Um, it says, according to Dr. Karen Horney, one of the unheralded geniuses in psychology, she goes, you need not and in fact cannot teach an acorn to grow into an oak tree. Mm. When given a chance, its intrinsic potentialities will develop. So just like that acorn that is genetically programmed to become a unique oak tree, we are programmed to become our true self. Now, you cannot teach a person to become their true self, but you can help a person learn to respect themselves so they can discover the unfolding of their true self through their life. Now, that rarely happens, and that's very unfortunate, Bonnie. Whenever I say that, I have a twinge of sadness inside of me. But few of us get that kind of an experience growing up. So what is it that the acorn needs to grow into the oak tree? It needs water, it needs sunshine, it needs certain nutrients in the soil. It can't be planted too close to the other oak tree, right? Because the oak tree will block its sun and it won't, it'll retard its growth. So it can't be exposed to trauma too early in life. Its roots have to take place in the soil so it can handle adverse conditions, right? Right, right. But, but... Just like that oak tree, or just like that acorn, I should say, we need the same thing. We need a certain kind of nourishment in our life. We need to have that sunlight. We need to be loved. We need to be seen. We need to be celebrated. But we also need a certain amount of frustration to be able to de deal with life, sure. to learn how to handle frustration, right? So if we're encouraged to grow according to who we really are, our life will unfold, and we will keep our integrity, our wholeness, which means that we will keep our connection to our true self. But unfortunately, very early in our lives, mind, probably before you and I can remember, we got anxious that we were not going to belong, that we were not going to be loved, that we weren't going to be accepted as we were. That anxiety she called the basic anxiety in life. And that anxiety gets us to start to search for a solution. We search for some way to be okay. She calls that search the search for glory, meaning that we want to find that 
top approval. We want to find that way of being in the world that's going to get us top approval, right? It's going to get us perfect security, perfect romance, those kinds of things. So in our search for that solution, we come up with some ideas about the self that we think we need to be to be loved and accepted and to belong. And she calls this our false self or our idealized self. Dr. John Amadeo, who we had on the show, likes to refer to this as our fabricated self. We could think of it as the engineered self, the self we design, the self that we try to create in order to ensure that people are going to love and accept us. Now, Mm. what's behind all this madness that's going on is this anxiety, right, that we're not going to be loved and accepted. What anxiety gets us to do, money, it turns us into control freaks. So very early on in our life, we say, I don't want to feel this anxiety. What do I have to do? Who do I have to become to ensure I'm going to be loved and accepted so I can control the outcome of my interactions with other people? So early on, we turn into control freaks. We try to control ourselves to become the self that we think we should be, and we try to control others so that we ensure that they're going to love and accept us. So here's the problem. When that happens, now let's imagine, you know, you know what a physical center of gravity is, right? It's right. Your weight is evenly distributed over both of your feet. In karate, they talk about the horse stance, the immovable stance, because it's a very solid stance where your weight is equally distributed over both feet. So if somebody pushes you, you're very solid. You have a solid foundation. That's why they call it the immovable stance. Well, she said, imagine that we have an emotional center of gravity. And when our emotional center of gravity is over and equally balanced over who we are, then we can't get knocked off balance that easy. But what we do is when we develop this false self, we now move our emotional center of gravity from within our true self, and we place it into this false self. So now our false self has to be accepted. People have to approve of it. People have to validate it for us to feel okay. So as soon as we've done that, we've created some shaky ground for us to stand on. And now we become dependent on how other people treat us to be okay. So this is the beginnings of the of emotional dependency. You you mentioned uh, that we do this very young, probably we can so young that we don't even remember it. That's right. Um do you and I'm just going to take a stab at, at this. I don't know if this is the case or not, but I'm wondering if part of this is that and the big book talks about it that that within every man there is a there is a measure of faith, uh there is a desire to seek after his creator, that kind of thing. Do you think that some of that may be, you know, okay, if if we're kind of almost born into this insecurity, um, that we're trying to seek our creator, but it gets perverted, it gets thwarted? Well, well, that you're getting, you're very warm in terms of this whole thing. Mm. The way I say this, I think our true self is a spiritual self. Mm-hmm. And I think that means that we're constantly seeking. Right. And we're seeking to be connected. We're seeking oneness. We're seeking to, you know, I think I've even said at some point that I love Scott Peck's work when he talks about God speaks to us through our unconscious. Mm. So it's, it's, I do think that this true self is the connection that we have and the connection that's restored to our higher power. Right. Let me say a little bit more about this true self in terms of what it looks like. So um, here, back on page five, right underneath the, the section on the true self, I say, given the proper set of circumstances, we will develop the unique forces of our true self. Well, what are these unique forces? They are the ability to experience the depth of our own feelings, of our own thoughts, our own wishes, our own desires, and our own needs. We will develop the faculty to express ourselves and spontaneously and respectfully relate to others. 
we will learn to equally honor our need for togetherness and our need to be ourselves. We will come to realize our own set of values and purpose in life. We will be able to tap our own resources to satisfy our needs and to regulate ourselves by soothing our pain or disappointment. We will develop a solid yet flexible self. So that's some of the characteristics of this true self that we've lost. So when we become this false self, instead of having this flexible self that can respond in whatever way we need to, to any situation, we now become very rigid, Monty. Yeah. We either have to be a people pleaser or we've got to have be right all the time or we've got to not care or whatever whatever is our solution. And she says our solution usually takes the form of one of three different things. And I talk about this a lot in my second book, 12 Smart Things You Can Do, you know, um, in recovery, and that is that you either move against people, right? You try to have power right, over people right. as a way to feel okay about yourself, or you try to pe- please people, you move towards them, or you run away. You move away from people, and you try to make nothing important in your life anymore. So those are the different strategies that people take. So people generally go in one of those trajectories or another. Um, so I wanted to mention that, but really the point here in terms of the emotional uh, dependency is that once we develop this false self, now we are dependent on how people treat us to mm-hmm. feel okay. Mm-hmm. He calls these that we have claims. We make claims and demands on other people. And you can see that when I start to say these things, if you go back to listen to Bill's letter again right. from one of our earlier shows, you can see how Bill was integrating a lot of these ideas that Dr. Karen Horn and I had uh, about people and our growth. So let me go on and say a little bit more. So what happens is, and this is a quote from her, she goes, at the core of this alienation from our actual self, which is the true self, is the loss of the feeling of being an active, determining force in our own lives. So now what happens with this false self that we've created, it takes over. We now serve it rather than it serving us. Mm. It hijacks us. We are now compulsively driven to be this self whether it works or not. It's like we must be this way to survive. We must be this way to be okay, even though it may be causing problems in our lives. Yee, when it causes yes. problems in our lives, we don't say that, wow, what I'm doing is a problem. We say, the problem is everybody else out there, they're not responding in the right way to us, right? We're the victim. This is like chasing the bag of dope. You got it. It's the same. See, now, you got to understand, this happens so early. This is happens before we pick up and right, use. Right, right, now, right, right. when we pick up and use... You know, it adds to this madness. You know, the, the, what I say many times when I try to help people understand addiction, the false self is an incredibly gracious host to addiction. Mm-hmm. It loves to have addiction come into its life because it totally bolsters everything the false self is trying to do. You, you bet. And you know what, I, what I'm, I'm seeing here is, is that, that statement I make all the time, there are no normies. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's got this. That's it. So see, this is it. This really shows you that that's true. Yeah. Because every one of us in this society does that. Now, so you obviously you get it, man. You see what a terrible problem this yeah, is. Yeah, you bet. So it really relates to this whole thing that we've been talking about in terms of emotional dependency. Because once we make, once we construct this false self, what we do is now we demand that other people validate it. Mm -hmm. When they validate our false self, we feel like they're validating us, and then we feel okay. But it's only temporary, isn't it? Because they're really, they're not validating our true self. It doesn't work, because then if they don't validate us, what happens? We're shaky. Yeah. See, because we've moved that emotional center of gravity off of who we really are, our true self, and we've put it over this false self. So now we're on shaky ground. If I keep my emotional center of gravity within me, then I'm going to be able to validate myself. You're going to be able to push against me. I'm going to be able to to hold my ground. I don't need you to make me feel okay. I'm okay. 
But when I put my emotional center of gravity in my false self, I need you to validate me to be okay. Yeah. So now the false self, and I'm going to use Bill's language here, hooks other people. It hooks other people into saying, you must validate me for me to be okay. You must approve of me. You must love me. You must treat me the way I want to. So the false self is filled with all kinds of rules about how things are supposed to be. It's filled about rules about how we're supposed to act. We call it the tyranny of the shoulds. We are driven by shoulds in our life. We don't run our show. The shoulds run our show. So that's what she was saying, is the determining force now lies in the false self instead of in your true self. When you're operating out of your true self, you don't live your life based on shoulds. Oh man, this is so great! I, I, I'm I'm reflecting on something that that Dan Griffin did um, at, at Cape Cod when he was talking about the rules. You know the rules that we have. Yeah. Um, you know, men don't cry, men don't ask for help. Uh, you know, all those kind of things. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I I have sat in front of a TV before and allowed my false false self to suck it up when watching a a, a very moving film. But my true self, man, I'll tell you what, and my wife knows it, who, who my true self is because I will cry at American Idol, brother. Yeah. You know, you know what I'm saying? And when I let myself do that, it is so cool. Yeah, yeah, because you're being spontaneous. Yeah. You're following your experience. And see, that's what happens when when we live, you know, out of our true self, when that's our basis, right? When that's yeah. our base then we are spontaneous, then we can experience the depth of our feelings. But when we live out of our false self, now we have to live up to these pretenses. We have to play games. We become phonies. And this is why everybody that you talk to has a terrible fear that they're going to be found out as a phony. Mm. This fear is pervasive in our culture. Because we've all sold out money. We've all become this false self, and we're waiting for somebody to pull the curtain back and see this little guy behind the curtain who's the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's not the Wizard of Oz, and that's why that movie was so powerful. It was showing us that we all put this big front out in terms of who we are, but we're behind that. Our real self is behind that. And, And what we don't know, is that who we are is much better than the self that we've created, than this self that we fabricated. Right. And, now, and, in recovery, and this is the way I describe recovery to people, recovery is about recovering your lost true self. Mm. You know, and here, here's the thing, too. Let's take that example of the Wizard of Oz again. The, the false self... The uh, floating head with the flames and the green smoke. Yeah, there you go. Generated fear. Yeah. It generated fear. Yeah, now, so what solution is that? Go back to the three solutions. Is that moving towards? Is that moving away from or moving against people? It's moving, well, gosh. That's moving against. Against, yeah. It's against. the power over solution. Yeah. It's I'm right. just, I'm going to intimidate you to do what I want to do. And when you when you let me have power over you, then I feel that I'm okay. And the th- amazing thing is, is when the wizard got found out, sure, they were a little upset with him for a few minutes, but they ended up falling in love with the guy. Yeah, there you go. That's right. And he was much more than that floating head. Yeah. He, he was much, there was more to him than there was seen just in that floating head, this powerful being mm-hmm. he was now a man with feelings he was a man with that wanted to help dorothy i mean there was a lot more to that man but he sold out he had to be the wizard to be okay okay don't go away folks we'll be right back more with dr allen Berger uh talking about this false self and real self it's amazing stuff you don't want to miss it don't go away listen to this let's walk through the big book join chris schroeder and the Monty Man for this in-depth journey through the basic text of Alcoholics Anonymous. As one of the most sought-after circuit speakers in the world of the 12 steps, Chris will be walking us through line by line, page by page, of this wonderful book 
that has meant so much to so many people who have recovered from the disease of alcoholism. If you have never studied the big book, or even if you have but would like a new refreshing approach, join us here at Take12Radio.com for an exciting, educational, and spiritual look into a plan for living that can be applied and implemented into the lives of anyone who is willing to recover from alcoholism. Hey, if you want your free copies of Walking Through the Big Book with Chris S., listen, all you have to do is visit us at Take12Radio.com, scroll down to the Recovery Workshops banner, click on it, and then click on Walking Through the Big Book. And there you'll find 34 one-hour workshops of this incredible series for you for free. All right, now let's return to our discussion, True Self, False Self, with myself and Dr. Alan Berger. Dr. Alan Berger was on the line, and we've been talking uh, about this thing that we do. This we 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 build this false self, and then we uh, put it, put it out there, and then that false self hooks on to other people. And, and Dr. Berger tries to hook other people in. I think it's the uh, way to yeah. say it. You see, we try to hook other people in to to validate that false self, and we demand that they accept us. They accept this, this false self as who we are and it validate us and approve us and love us. And if they don't, then we do a lot of different tricky things to try to get their acceptance and validation. And so it, it, isn't it's that, a very, very, very big problem. Isn't that so strange that you would think that deep down inside we would want them to validate our true self? Well, see, this is the problem, Monty. This is why most people, when they get in a relationship and someone falls in love with this phony act that we put on, and right. I, I, listen, I'm not judging anybody. I've, I've done this in my life, too. I mean, I think that I'm more my true self today than I've ever been. But, my God, did you have to accept my games and my, and my bullshit before for in thinking I needed that to feel okay. And I thought I had to be this person, you know, like... Like Dan was saying, Dan Griffin was saying, with all the man rules, well, I had those in spades, man. I had to be, you know, I had and, and rules on top of that. Like I had to be perfect. Yeah, I had to be all knowing. I had to have all these things that I didn't have. Right. And I didn't feel okay about myself, but I still wanted you to accept me. You see, that's the insanity of it. We reject ourselves for this false self, and then we want other people to validate our false self. But that's why we can never feel love. That's why we're never filled. That's why we're always empty, is because we're, you know, the people that have fallen in love with us, this act that we put on, not us. They haven't fallen in love with us. They've fallen in love with our false self. Yeah. There if, was a if they've great done that. book that my sponsor, and I forgot who wrote it, but it was some Catholic priest, I think, or a nun, that says, I'm afraid that uh, if you know who I really am, you won't love me. Sure. My tendency is to only let you know enough about me to make me look good. I'm a recovering hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's yeah. right. Well, listen to what Karen Horne says. She goes, and she's talking about this <laughs> false self that we've created. She goes, the integrity of a person is impaired because of the alienation from the self, from the true self. What this creates is an unavoidable, unconscious pretenses. Unavoidable, unconscious pretenses. Meaning that we have to be a certain way to be okay. She goes, it also causes the unavoidable, unconscious compromises due to the unsolved conflicts. Now what that means, these compromises are, is means that we have to compromise who we are. So we can't be angry, let's say, if that's our solution or we can't be needy, or we have to disown certain parts of ourselves that don't fit with the false self that we've created. So any part of you that shows up that is not prescribed, right, by yeah. the false self is a part of you that you have to get rid of, that you despise, that you hate, that you're ashamed of, because this is not who you're supposed to be. So we so let's say a guy has some tender feelings or something like that, and that shows up, and he thinks, "Oh my God, if I have tender feelings, it means that I'm you know a soft male or before even worse, you know for some guys thinking that God that means I'm gay, you know all of this nonsense right that person will reject 
any of those feelings and disown them and ignore them, not integrate them into their person. So those are the unavoidable unconscious compromises that we make. Wow. She goes, she goes the, the self-contempt mm. comes from hating parts of yourself that don't fit with who you should be. She goes, all these forces lead to a weakening of the moral fiber in the nucleus, which is a diminished ca- capacity for being sincere with oneself. Let me read that again. She goes, all these forces lead to a weakening of the moral fiber in the nucleus, meaning in the true self, which is a diminished capacity for being sincere with oneself. Our problem is that we don't know how to be sincere with ourselves. We don't know how to honor ourselves. We don't know how to take care of ourselves. And because of this, we fail in protecting ourselves. So what are the unenforceable rules we put on ourselves? You got it. That's yeah. where it starts. And then when you put unenforceable rules on yourself, guess what else you do? You put them on everybody, everybody else. Everybody else. So we make those claims and demands of ourselves, and we take those same claims and demands, and we now create a version for everybody else to live up to. This is what creates our emotional dependency. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about this from some other theorists in in other directions or in other ways of understanding it. But you can see that, that her model, I think, fits so well with helping us understand what we need to do to unhook our dependency on others. It begins by discovering and getting centered back in our true self. So is but this I, is this why is is this why um, the other person never really truly satisfies? Where it's never enough. We're always chasing it after the elusive approval because the false self is the one that's getting validated and not the true self. Right on. You yeah. got it, Bonnie. Yeah. You got it. That's why that's oh. why we that's why there's what was that line in the twelve and twelve? There is never enough of what we thought we needed. Yeah. This is why we're insatiable. We can never be filled up. This is also why we're addicted to more, because that false self can never be satisfied. Yeah. It's about more. It's about getting more validation. It's about getting more love. It's we're driven by more. Yeah, you bet. You bet. But the true self, the true self, if allowed to, can be satisfied, correct? That's right. The true self is able to yeah. be satisfied. It's able to um, to go through the cycle of experience. And when we get something we really need and we, let's say, satisfy a need or resolve some tension, then, then we feel good. And we feel good about ourselves in a way that's 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 not based on what anybody else is doing. It's based on what we're doing. So the false self, let's say, will make amends to get other people to approve of it. Right, right. The true oh. self make amends because it's the right thing. Because it's the right thing to do. And you know, I've I've heard for years. I have heard, and you probably have too. I have heard sponsors tell their sponsees. I have heard speakers in meetings. Tell the tell the people attending the meeting that you make amends for yourself. You don't make it because the other person deserves uh, right. uh, amends. And I always thought, but that's twisted. They do deserve our amends. They we wrong them. They right. deserve uh, our our apology. Our asking them to forgive us. Our amends that we make, making it right because it's the right thing to do, not because we're supposed to be soothing ourselves. Right. Yeah. Well, l- listen, but what I am saying is when you make amends because it's the right thing to do, you are soothing yourself. Right, exactly. And when you make amends, whether that other person accepts them or not, if you truly make amends for the right reason, right. then you've done all you can do. So, yes, they deserve our amends, but we can't control whether they're going to accept them or not. Right, and if we're doing it this for the right reasons, it When we do things yeah. because we need to do them, they're the right thing for us to do, because they're coming out of our true self, then we don't need somebody to to validate. approve of us, validate ourselves, yeah. or forgive us. Right, and that's what I was saying. If we're doing it for the right reasons, if they do not respond in kind, it's okay. That's right. See, yeah. there's room for the other person to be themselves. When right, you're right. doing things out of your false self, then the other person, there isn't room for them to be themselves. They must be what we need them to be. 
is this the same kind of uh same same kind of dirty trick we pull on ourselves when we give a gift and then that person uh gives that gift away and then we get ticked off because they gave our gift away right so that's the hook in that's you the give hook the in. gift and now they must appreciate it but right. when you truly give a gift you give it to them and you're done as soon as you give it to them and if it's not what they want you can learn from it and say I'm sorry that I, I wasn't more tuned into you and I'd like to give you something that you'd appreciate but you give it to them be and you let them do whatever they will with it yeah and maybe maybe they enjoyed it so much they thought that somebody that they knew would appreciate it as much as they did. Maybe it's a compliment. Right. But we don't see it we, we because we're so wrapped up in, I'm doing this for you because I'm looking for something from you. And that's the, that's the emotional dependency, and that's the hook. Oh, man. Now, what I say to people in, part, in terms of understanding the therapeutic value of the 12 steps is that step one starts to deconstruct the false self. Okay. When we admit we are powerless over alcohol or other drugs, when we admit that we are powerless over our addiction and that our lives have become unmanageable, our false self is weakened. Mm. You bet. It deconstructs our false self. So everywhere that you hear in the literature, in our program literature, AA literature, and a literature where they talk about ego, you can now replace that with false self to have even a clear understanding of what that ego is. Our ego in the literature is really our false self. Gotcha. So as soon as we start to surrender or at first admit, right, uh, to the fact that we're powerless and our lives have become unmanageable, what it means is that this solution in life that we had isn't working. Right, And then right. we can no longer rely on it. So the way I describe this to people is that step one shatters our reliance on our false self. And, and, and doesn't it now, – now let me, let me interject a, a little, little spiritual sprinkle here. Isn't, isn't the steps – isn't their purpose to show us a need for a power? Well, I, I think their purpose is to help us realize that the power that we've been operating from, which is our false self, doesn't work. And what they're showing us is that we have to connect to a different part of ourselves if our lives are going to work. What I'm saying is that what they help us do is connect to our true self, okay. which is our path to our spirituality or to our connection with our higher power. And our true self needs to have that higher power in our lives to make us complete, don't you think? The, what, the way I would say it is the true self is, is the connection to that higher power that helps us find a way to complete ourselves. Gotcha. See, that, that's the way I would say it more from a humanistic psychologist perspective, right. is, that, is that if our spirituality is working, it's helping us learn to deal with life and to be more fully um, ourselves. And our false self just isn't able to do that because our false self, false is... self cuts ourselves off from it. Right, right. You can't have a God in your life when you play God. That's right. I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah, right? you bet. I mean, you bet. You just can't. You can't find a higher power. Your false self is the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's the God. He's the God. He's going to tell everybody how you should do it. He's going to be in control and run the show. That's what our false self does. Yeah. So you see in the Big Book when they talk about we are the. Right? We are yeah. the author or the author of this script, right? Right, and right. We're, trying to get it. we're writing everybody's role and how everybody should act. That's what our false self is doing. Yeah, you it bet. Has, it has a script on what everybody is supposed to do and how people are supposed to be for us to be okay. Have you ever met anybody that really had a handle on their true self? I mean, and it didn't seem to have this. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I I think there's several people in my life that I've met that way. I mean, I think that uh, you're someone that's getting closer to that in your life. Mm -hmm. um, Father Richard Rohr, somebody I know uh, and met and spent some time with, I really think he's on that journey. I think a lot of the spiritual leaders, Thich Nhat Hanh, um, the, you know, was on that path. I think Martin Luther King. Um, Gandhi was on that path. I think there's a lot of people we can look at in our 
in our lives to see that they were on that path. I think Bill Wilson was on that path. Because I, I say... I think um, Dr. Bob was on that path. I, I, I have a friend, they, they, they affectionately call him Serenity J., uh, Jay says, but when he introduces himself, I, "Hi, my name is Jay, and I'm celebrating Serenity today." And he means it. Uh-huh. And and what he means, and, and he t- once in a while he'll share exactly what he means. He means that he he's not controlled by what other people do or don't do. Um, his 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 he's he's not living to be happy based on the happenings around him. He. He lives in serenity, regardless of the happenings around him, and um, so he, he's like he, he's a lot like that. Now, people they laugh because he's been saying this for over forty five years, and he doesn't change. And, and, and this guy has gone through horrific uh, medical conditions. And and this man has got more peace, I am telling you, and yet people will say, yeah, that's, that can't be true. He can't really be serene. And I'm telling you, he is. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, and I see, and, and I think that um, my sponsor, Tom, mm-hmm. I think had, because one of the things with the true self, you will see an incredible authenticity. Yeah, that the person is really who they are. They don't need to play any games, have any pretense. And see, that's who—that's what really turned me on in the program, is when I saw a Tom share, and he was able to share with a complete freedom from his false self. He was able to talk about things that I wouldn't dare tell anybody about. Yeah, he was able to do it with an incredible courage. And, and like I said, straightforwardness, authenticity, honesty. I mean, these things blew my mind. And I tell people all the time when I share my story, is what happened to me at 19 when I got exposed to Alcoholics Anonymous, is I got turned on. I got so excited. The, there was an interest, a desire that grew in me to, to be able to be that liberated from myself, from my false self. And I saw that in Tom, and he achieved that by working the steps. Yeah, wow. Talk about a so spiritual this, awakening. This is what Dr. Karen Horney says, and then we'll leave this with the, the end of the show. She goes, the therapeutic value in the disillusioning process, the disillusioning process, and this is, I'm putting this in parentheses, is, is, uh, is shattering our reliance on our false self and starting to realize, becoming disillusioned with this solution, and understanding that this solution not only is not going to solve the problems in our life, but is a big part of how these problems are created in our lives. So this disillusioning process starts with us realizing that our problems are of our own making. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we think that our our problems problems are are of our own making. So she goes... The therapeutic value in the disillusioning process lies in the possibility that, with the weakening of the obstructive forces, the constructive forces of the real self have a chance to grow. With the weakening of the obstructive forces, the obstructive forces, in our case, being our false self, and the program is called our ego, and our addiction, and our addictive self. So with the weakening of those forces, the constructive forces of our real self has a chance to grow and help us actualize and become the person that we could possibly be, the best person we can possibly be. Uh. That's the excitement of all this. And, and this is the mar- remarkable thing, and I talk about this a lot in my new book, Monty, in 12 Hidden Rewards. I talk about the therapeutic value of the steps. In fact, Part one of that book is all about the therapeutic forces that are operating in the 12th step. So if you want to have more of a psychological understanding of what's going on in the steps, I encourage you to read my book. Uh, Another great show. I mean, uh, folks, listen. Can you identify with some of this stuff? I I think if you're listening, you can. Um, If just a little bit piqued your interest and you were doing the dishes or something, go back and rewind this. Take the take the little uh, little arrow and slide it back and start it over again. Um, 
this this is valuable information, and if you will uh, learn it and apply the principles uh, that we talk about when we do this show, your life's only going to get better. Well, thank you, Dr. Berger. Hey, thank you, Money. I love you, man, and keep up the great work. All right. Until our next broadcast, do something now that will make the person you'll be tomorrow proud to have been the person you are today, your true self. Think about that. And so our next broadcast, this is the Monty Man along with Dr. Alan Berger, and we're wishing God's perfect serenity for you. Bye-bye. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. <laughs>